Welcome to our lecture on cognitive linguistics. Today we're going to start with the historical development of cognitive linguistics. Dobrovska and Diviak in their handbook say that cognitive linguistics is an approach to language study based on the assumptions that our linguistic abilities are firmly rooted in our general cognitive abilities, that meaning is essentially conceptualization, and that grammar is shaped by usage. Maybe you find that pretty uncontroversial. It does seem to make a lot of sense. But rest assured, these claims are anything but uncontroversial. Today, we will take a closer look at the historical controversy around these claims, and that will allow us a first introduction to cognitive linguistic approaches. Let's start with a completely opposite approach, mainstream generative grammar. You will probably have heard of Noam Chomsky, the most famous and still most important linguist of our times. In 1957, he published Syntactic Structures, a major criticism of behaviourist linguistics. And in 1965, aspects of the theory of syntax, where he further developed his transformational model of language and claiming that there is a universal grammar of language, a language acquisition device. Lectures on the government and binding and the minimalist programme in the 80s and 90s, respectively, were further important steps in the development of his theory. What Chomsky did was, was criticising the behaviourist empirical approach. He focused on knowledge of language as producing and understanding an infinite number of sentences. In that sense, his grammar is generative. What are the main claims of generative grammar? Well, generativists take a mentalistic view of language, so they focus on language in the mind. They argue that language is innate, so in your genes there's a universal grammar, and because of that, kids all around the world can learn languages so quickly, so fast, and in a similar fashion. On top of that, they consider language to be an independent module in the mind, so it's set off from general intelligence, um, or from your understanding of maths or music. And finally, that performance, whenever we say something or hear something, is not really that important. Language usage doesn't play a huge role. It's more about the competence, the knowledge of language in your mind, which to a great degree is going to be shaped by universal grammar. Now, in cognitive linguistics, it's easy to dismiss all of these claims. Um, but it is important to understand that for a long time, mainstream generative grammar dominated linguistics. So we need to take a closer look at the evidence for innate universal grammar modules. One piece of evidence that is often used are so-called grammar genes. There is a gene called FOXP2, and in a British family, it turned out that this gene had a defect, and they suffered from something that people called specific language impairment. As the name already says, it seemed as if their language alone was impaired, whereas their other cognitive skills seemed to be intact. So they seemed to have had normal intelligence, nothing else seemed to have gone wrong but language. Now that would be good evidence for an innate grammar, right? Because if something in your genes went wrong and all it affected was language, then well, that could be evidence that universal grammar is part of our genetic setup. As it turns out, however, People who suffer from specific language impairment also have other motor problems. This is called apraxia. So also the planning of motor action, also the planning of speech is impacted. And that's not purely universal grammar. That's not purely grammar at all. So this is a piece of evidence that goes against the claim that language is innate. Sometimes generativists will point out that there are so-called linguistic savants, people who are verbally fairly fluent, but who seem to be um, intellectually challenged, who have a, a fairly low IQ. So again, that seems to be a piece of evidence that shows that IQ, intelligence and language seem to be independent. But when you look more closely at the IQ of these people, IQ is always something that is measured compared to your mental age. So let's just say as a 20 year old, you have to know a lot more to have an IQ of 100 than a three or four year old, right? So it's age related. And if you look at the, the mental age, not the real age, um, but the mental age of these linguistic savants, you find that very often their mental age is going to be something like five or six. And if you then compare their linguistic abilities to kids of that age, then you will see that their development seems fairly normal and there is nothing exceptional about them. 
Another piece of evidence um, that the generativists um, claim shows that language is innate is brain localization. So a lot of what is going on in the brain is going to be in the left peritotemporal, so this area here. Um, and you can localize sort of um, that these neurons are going to fire up when specific language planning or language processing goes on. But as with many neural uh, phenomena, um, children suffering from aphasia, so um, loss of um, blood supply to these areas um, at a very young age, show great plasticity. Okay, so the brain can rewire and they can speak normally using other parts of their brain. And also it's not the case that when you speak it's only these language parts that fire up, but as we will see in the session on embodiment, other areas of the brain relating for example to motor action are also activated. So this isn't really an independent module. Next, some people claim that there's a critical period. So for maturation you need to get a bit of linguistic input before the age of six, or some people say 12, and if you don't get that, then, you norm it, then your language is not going to develop normally. Um, that seems to be genetically encoded then, if it's the same for all people. But the evidence for this is not as convincing, but there is no clear evidence for this. It is obvious that the younger you learn a language, the better you are going to be at it, but that pretty much applies to all cognitive skills. The earlier you start riding a bike, the earlier you start to do maths, the better you're going to get at it if you continue it all through your life. So at the end of the day, no, researchers haven't been able to clearly identify a critical period which would argue for an innate universal grammar. And finally, um, there's the idea of the poverty of stimulus. Chomsky often says that kids don't get all the input they need and they don't just repeat the input that they hear, so they're not parrots, and that is perfectly correct. But at the same time, he also argues that some of the structures that kids come up with are not in their input. And that would mean, of course, it must be in their genetic setup, which should be part of universal grammar. But as we will see, the poverty of stimulus argument is not as convincing as many people thought for a long time. Let's look at this in more detail. One claim, for example, that was supposed to show that there is a universal grammar is structure dependency. Take the sentence, the child that is alone is unhappy. In that sentence, you've got two instances of to be. The first one in light blue is, and the second one in orange is too. Now, the light blue one is part of the relative clause, the child that is alone. That is alone is a relative clause, and the is one is embedded in that. The second one is the main clause predicate. So X is unhappy is the main clause, the child is unhappy, and the second is is our main clause verb. Now when kids form a question, they got to say, is the child that is alone unhappy? But not, is the child that is alone unhappy? And Chomsky argues that the kids don't really hear questions like two, um, is the child that is alone unhappy? And even if some kids do, not all of them do. So they don't get this input. So shouldn't they, at least some of them, make the mistake of using the first form of to be and making it the first part of the question? Because if you've only got one auxiliary in a sentence, the child is unhappy, and you ask a question, you've got to take the first auxiliary and put it to the front to make a question. Is the child unhappy? Or at least so it seems, right? So that seems to be a very simple rule. Take the first auxiliary and put it to the start, of a sentence to turn this into a question. But as you see in examples like one where there is a relative clause, you can't do that because if you did that and if you used the first auxiliary, the sentence would be ungrammatical. Is the child that alone is unhappy? And kids really don't say this. So is this evidence for structure dependency being part of universal grammar? Well, probably no. First of all, something that the genitivists completely ignore because for them it's a, it's a different module within the language module is semantics. The child that is alone is a chunk. It's a referential chunk. Okay, So even in the child that is alone is unhappy, the construct is made up of a construction. The child that is alone, one element, is unhappy. And so if you ask whether someone is unhappy or not, you wouldn't take out something out of this chunk. Okay, The meaning glues it together. And on top of that, Pullman shots have shown that kids actually do get examples of 
uh, sentences like 2a in their input. So things like, is the boy who was crying still here? So it's not true that there's a poverty of stimulus, that kids don't hear it. And on top of that, in stark contrast to what the generativists say, um, it's not just structure that kids have, they have meaning as well. And if you take full meaning pairing, something that's going to be of huge importance in cognitive linguistics, uh, and take these to be the central unit, then it's clear why kids say 2a, but never come up with 2b. From the 1970s, an alternative to generative grammar emerged, and that field of study is known as cognitive linguistics. Cognitive linguistics argues that there is a specific human property, and that's symbolic thinking. The idea that we associate form and meaning in linguistic signs like apple, tree, table, and so on. They also argue that language is acquired through usage. So it's not an innate grammar that plays a huge role, but input and input frequency. And we analyze this input subconsciously, drawing on general cognitive abilities, as we will see in this lecture. So perception, attention, memory, categorization, abstraction, all of these play a role. It's not a language module per se that does the job, but our general cognitive apparatus. Especially important, as we will see, is input frequency, but also joint attention, that you and I know what we're talking about um, and that we can detect patterns um, where similarity shows up. One of the first major publications in the field of cognitive linguistics was George Lakov's Women, Fire and Dangerous Things. In our session on categorization, we're going to get back to this because their prototypes, the idea that some instances of a category um, like Robin are better instances of an abstract category like bird than, for example, penguin, um, and that we have gradients of membership instead of just a categorical yes or no membership um, played a huge role. Another important publication was Ron Langacker's Foundations of Cognitive Grammar. Langacker pointed out that symbolic thinking is of great importance in the organization of grammar, um, from work classes up to phrasal patterns. On top of that, he developed um, a full cognitive linguistic model of how language works and how it interacts with domain general uh, abilities. And finally, Leonard Telmy's work on cognitive semantics was groundbreaking. He, for example, looked at how abstract categories like motion and manner are encoded linguistically in the syntactic patterns of different languages and how a cognitive approach can help explain the variation that we find in languages. An important topic in cognitive linguistics is, as I said, how domain general principles shape language. And a very important factor here is embodiment. So take he's in love, they fell out of love, she got over the heartbreak. In all of these, love is of course an abstract concept, and if you had to define it, you would see that it's really difficult. But the way that we talk about it in the examples three to five is that we treat it like a concrete thing, something that you can be contained in, or that you can fall out of. It's like a box, right? You can be in the box, then you're in love, or you're out of love, or you fall out of love, and then you're out of the box. And in the same sense, heartbreak is something that you have to jump over to get past you. So you can see how having a body and experiencing things like being in a building, or being outside of a building, or jumping over something, can be used to talk about abstract concepts like love. In the upcoming weeks, we will talk more about embodiment in week three and metaphors which underlie the use in three and five. And that's going to be the topic of lecture number 10. Note that this doesn't just show up uh, in made up examples that linguists come up with. Take the following newspaper article. As you will see in this article, um, the embodied metaphors abound. The best way to get over someone really is to get under someone. New study on rebound relationship finds people who move on quickly are emotionally healthier. Despite the rhetoric about moving on too fast from a previous lover, a new study has found those who do move on quickly are emotionally better off. The study by researchers at City University of New York and the University of Illinois discovered people who entered into a rebound relationship, defined as a relationship where the individual still has romantic attachments to their ex-partner, are happier and have healthier relationships. Even in this very short paragraph, you can see that relationships 
are treated like a journey in there, that we conceptualize a very complex concept like relationships by drawing on something um, very basic like a journey. Because moving in space, going from A to B, from a source to a goal, is something that we've experienced in our bodies from day to day. And we use this, we use this journey metaphor to talk about relationships. Because you move on um, too fast or too slow, you enter into a new relationship, or you get over it because it's in your way onto a new person. And in the final paragraph, you can also, the findings also show people in new relationships were more confident and felt more attractive than those left trying to get over the heartbreak alone. So they're still sort of trying to get over the obstacle in their way, the heartbreak, which would allow them to move along um, in their journey to the next relationship. But cognitive linguistics doesn't only focus on how domain general cognitive principles like embodiment shape language, but also how language tells us something about our thought processes. Because one important concept in cognitive linguistics is construal, the idea that language is a window on our thought. Take the same event, okay, I break a vase. Now if you were to videotape this and show it to a couple of people, then they wouldn't all say, well, this guy broke the vase. Some would say Tom broke the vase. Others would say the vase was broken by Tom. Um, then you'd have the vase broke into a million pieces. And maybe someone will, might say Tom broke the vase into a million pieces. It's not that one of these sentences is more correct than the others. They're all correct. What language affords us is construal different point of views, different perspectives on the same scene. So six, seven, eight, and nine are linguistic constructions that allow us to focus on different parts of the event. And that's very important. So language is going to show us how a speaker looks at a specific scene or how they construe it. So six to nine <clears throat> describe the same event, but from different perspectives. And that's what we call construal. Summing up. In stark opposition to generativism, cognitive linguistic holds that language is not modular and innate. It is shaped by usage and domain general principles. And that's going to be the main topic of this lecture. I will try to show you how language is shaped by usage, by domain general principles, and also in what way language allows us to see the thought processes that underlie what someone is saying. We already talked about embodiment very briefly in this session. This is going to be the main topic of the next lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to seeing you again soon.